Well, we're showing 8 a.m. on the clock here, so why don't we, why don't we go ahead and get started. I'm, I'll call to order uh, today's meeting of the City of Tumwater General Government Committee. It is Wednesday, February 8th at 8 a.m., um, and we will begin. So why don't we start off with roll call. Um, all council members are, are present and accounted for despite various states of uh, drowsiness um, because this is our first 8 a.m. meeting as opposed to our, our usual 2 p.m. meeting time. Uh, the first order of, of substantive business is just approval of the meeting minutes from the October 12th, 2022, November 9th, 2022, and January 11th, 2023 meetings. Is there a motion to approve that set of minutes? So move. Is there a I'll second? second. Okay. <laughs> motion by, by council member Kathy and seconded by council member Dahlhoff. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. So to our, our more substantive portion of the agenda, um, our first item is the interlocal agreement amendment uh, number two with the Regional Housing Council um, regarding the council structure. Brad, I think you're gonna walk us through this. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, good so morning. this is the, as, as uh, Council Member Althauser mentioned, this is the second amendment to the interlocal agreement that the uh, city participated in in 2021. Um, and the intent is to uh, add on the new things that the RHC needs to do to address the sales and use tax for housing and related services that was adopted by Thurston County and, and also by the city of Olympia. Uh, the proposal before you and what the uh, recommendation from staff is, is that the uh, GGC review and schedule uh, the attached interlocal agreement uh, amendment to, as a consent item for your February 21st city council meeting and recommend that the council approve uh, the amendment for signature by the mayor. Uh, just one thing that we're still working through um, on the regional level, I guess there is an additional whereas clause that the county wants to add uh, to the document that I have not seen yet. So it, no other changes are I'm, I'm aware of uh, to the document, but we're still waiting on that. So uh, just as a note, we may need to uh, delay that slightly if we don't get that in sufficient time. Uh, the primary purpose, again, of the Regional Housing Council is to really leverage resources and partnerships uh, across the region to address a whole range of things dealing with homelessness and affordable housing. Um, and we're now entering, uh, we've, <laughs> the Regional Housing Council has evolved in a, in a pretty good way, I think. Um, we now have the availability of using the home fund dollars through this process. Uh, and there, as part of this process, also a part of this amendment process, uh, we're looking to establish a couple of advisory boards uh, made up of community members and uh, people who are active in the field who would deal with things like uh, homelessness services allocations, as well as uh, the affordable housing component. Um, just to let you know, um, staff completed their review of the applications for those positions um, last week, and they, today is the day that they're, I think they have um, <laughs> about 35 interviews scheduled. Uh, it's, it's sort of a speed dating, 10 minutes apiece kind of thing, but uh, the, the intent is to get all of these uh, groups up and going in time for the next funding cycle this year. Um, and have that uh, basically take over the role of the tech team uh, doing that work and all of that. So the proposed amendments uh, include all of that. Um, again, the staff recommendation is that, uh, that this should be supported. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. So we don't have a <clears throat> meeting today. They're gonna be doing interviews. So. Uh, we will have our regular RHC meeting at four. Uh, the RHC tech team meeting has been canceled because of the interviews, but we will have our regular first of the month meeting. And something's also on the 15th? Um, no, that would be, that's, I don't know what's on. I thought the, our meeting today got pushed to next week. Well, yeah, I, I did too. Well, you guys got the... Uh, Ah, 
sorry, this is what happens when you read your schedule. And notice you've got two. I have two meetings scheduled at the same time that haven't been canceled yet. So thank you. I'll take that off. <clears throat> you better get to those interviews if you've got two meetings. On no, that. no. I was the only person <laughs> who read through all the 40 applications and I got out of the actual interview process. So. Yeah, on the on the fifteenth on my calendar, it says rescheduled RHC for PM. Mine too. Thank you. Would have been really lonely today. Well, it's not even five after. Boy, we've uh, really moving here. <laughs> we got Brad. Um, out. Yeah, I, Brad, would you um? Mind talking a little bit about the changes to 1406 because I, I do think that is sort of a, a substantive change in the ILA. It, originally, we had my, my understanding of like version one of the ILA, and and just to refresh folks who, who might be watching is like the 1406 dollars is our sales tax retention that the state legislature passed that allows us to essentially get maybe like $30,000 a year to put towards these projects. And so we had always envisioned pooling that money regionally, but had also said that, you know, if, if a project does not materialize, then we still have the discretion to use that money in the meantime, because we, we don't want it to just sit in a bank account. It's bad, like, like it's not helping anyone in a bank account. It's also not demonstrating to the legislature that it has been an effective appropriation of funds which undermines the future argument to increase that amount. Um, but the, the, the ILA sort of changes how we can do that a little bit in a way that, I, that I'm okay with. Um, it basically says that like the, minors, correct me if this is an incorrect interpretation, Brad, but like the presumption is that all of the money is part of the RHC for the $1,406. And if a jurisdiction wants to spend it in a different fashion because it's sitting stagnant, then the RHC has to essentially give that jurisdiction permission in order to do that and then spend the money. Is that correct? Yeah, what the, what the change is, and you're, you substantially do this correct, that the change is the before, uh, if more than a year had elapsed and 1406 funds had not been spent, the jurisdictions could request uh, the RHC return them uh, through a vote of the RHC. The change is, uh, they got rid of that one year portion and changed it to both 1406 and HSF funds uh, collected by the RHC may be returned to the local jurisdictions uh, for eligible projects consistent with adopted funding priorities through the annual applica application process. So there's a structure for requesting the monies back. Uh, basically, if it, it meets regional goals and the other jurisdictions agree, the funds can be returned and it doesn't require after a year to wait. So that just in regular language, that means if Tumwater has a project, keep it for that fits with the goals of the overall arching goals, we can use it here in our own jurisdiction. Exactly. And yeah. there was also a, a portion in there that dealt with, you know, uh, laying out funding priority uh, and plans for one, years one, two, and three for 1406 funds. Uh, that was taken out of the ILA. I do think from a practical matter, we'll probably will try to track those kinds of things because it makes, you know, makes sense to save money for a big project if we know it's coming versus trying to spend it incrementally if, if that doesn't work. Thanks for that explanation. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any questions about the draft or the language or? Uh, I'm good with it. I know you both serve on it, so it's great to hear your insight. And I appreciate, you know, a lot of times we work on the stuff, we just have arbitrary like one year or these limits or these times. So I appreciate that that was taken out. It's actually reflective of if any projects come about. So I'm supportive of it. Okay. Um, if, the, if there aren't any more questions, do we need, I guess if we wanna recommend that council approve this, then we need a motion um, to put it on the consent calendar with our recommendation. Correct. Which I'm happy to make move. everyone else. Yeah. Okay, so moved by council member Kathy, I'll, I'll second it. Okay. Uh, so a motion by, by council member Kathy to recommend passage of 
of the ILA in, in substantively similar form, I should say, because there, there might be that one whereas clause added that you alluded to, Brad. Um, and I'll make a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. So our next item on the agenda is the urban forestry management plan regarding uh, tree and vegetation preservation regulations. Uh, thank you, Janet, for coming this early in the morning. Um, I'd like to first introduce Kim Frappier with the Watershed Company. She's our consultant who's helping us with this project. Uh, before she sort of presents what we're where we are in the process, I'd like to set the stage for, if I can. Um, as you're aware, we adopted the Urban Forestry Management Plan in 2021. Uh, the City Council adopted that with a series of actions. Uh, a number of those actions were updating our regulations uh, that dealt with trees, and we identified three different things that we wanted to uh, update. And first of all was the uh, tree protection and vegetation protection regulations in 1608. Uh, we also were asked to update the street tree plan and regulations and also our landscaping regulations. All of those processes are now underway. Um, we are staggering them so uh, you won't see them all at once, but the, we wanted to have them overlap because we knew things that would change in one would probably affect another and we wanted to have flexibility to address those as they went through the process. Um, we started this project in October of last year um, and we prepared a public engagement plan that is uh, that includes all of the outreach efforts that were needed to get us to this particular point. Uh, we started those outreach efforts in the fall of last year. Uh, that included a website, community survey, uh, external and in internal stakeholder meetings. And uh, the watershed group has prepared a gap analysis, which I included in your packet, uh, that looked at our existing code. So we are now uh, complete with the first phase of the public outreach for the project. And now we are transitioning into the actual drafting of ordinance language. And as has been requested uh, by the city council, we wanted to make sure that we check in with you of where we are in the process, what we have done to this point, uh, to make sure that uh, you understand where we've been. And if you have any questions or suggestions of where we need to go, uh, we can get those now and go from there. This will be the first check-in uh, on our projects. Uh, I believe um, next month we'll be checking in with you on the street tree ordinance. Um, we probably can also give you a quick update on where we are on the, on the tree vegetation as we need to. So with that, um, Kim, if you'd like to start your presentation. Thank you, Brad. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, so as Brad mentioned, my name is Kim Frappier. I am an environmental planner and urban forester with the Watershed Company. And our agenda for today, um, which Brad has already um, provided some background on, is to review the project status and timeline um, for uh, the regulation update to TMC 1608. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the public engagement process that we have gone through, provide an overview of the policy analysis that we provided uh, to the city, and talk about some key topics for consideration as we enter into the process of developing the amendments to the ordinance. So Brad has already given you an overview of uh, kind of where we are to date with the project. Um, just wanted to add that um, we have concluded our, um, you know, as part of this effort, we developed a public engagement plan um, that was reviewed by the tree board and the planning commission. And we launched um, public engagement efforts in the fall. Um, and this included a, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. And so we, we just concluded that um, in December and we here in the first quarter of 2023, um, we are really uh, getting into the amendment development process based on all the feedback that we received from um, 
from external and internal stakeholders, um, as well as the tree board and the planning commission. Um, moving into second quarter of 2023, we'll really be focusing on um, the ordinance update process, continued work sessions with the planning commission and the tree board, and then the planning commission hearing, and then moving into third quarter, of course, um, city council work sessions um, and continued briefings with, um, with this committee. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the public engagement process that we went through um, after developing the public engagement plan. Oops, sorry about that. Um, we held a series of three external stakeholder meetings that we called community conversations, um, where we engaged um, community members in hybrid um, online. They were hybrid meetings, which were a combination of online and in-person um, en engagement meetings where we discussed specific topics. Um, and the, the overall goal there was to solicit broad outreach, um, you know, engage a wide and diverse audience, and then compile and distill you know, their feedback into actionable guidance for the regulation update process. You know, in addition to the engagement meetings, we all and the online open house, um, we also sent out print materials, um, postcards and posters um, were distributed um, throughout the city. And then city staff also um, did some direct engagement with stakeholders, having um, personal, more personal one on one meetings with different stakeholders. So um, to start the community conversations process with external stakeholders, um, we focused on some key discussion topics, and these were presented um, based on uh, certain aspects of the urban forestry management plan that were related to the code update process. And so these included um, incentives to support tree planting and retention, um, preserving and replacing of trees, um, designating special trees and groves, specifically large diameter trees, and um, looking at how the city allocates tree account funds, and then addressing environmental justice and equitable allocation of resources. So, um, we want to share some of the themes and ideas that have emerged from the three community conversations meetings with external stakeholders. Um, some of the priorities and ideas that emerged from those discussions included um, protecting large diameter trees, considering habitat values of trees, groves, and corridors, um, developing clear permitting requirements with specific consideration for creating a minor and major tree permit structure, uh, stronger tree retention and replacement requirements, incentives for both homeowners and developers um, to, for tree preservation, um, looking at climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, stricter code enforcement um, was uh, a topic that was raised, as well as uh, developing strong but fair penalties for violations. And uh, one topic that we discussed was the use of a point or credit system for determining tree retention and replacement requirements. So at the same time that we were conducting the community engagement, we were also developing the gap analysis. And the gap analysis really just focuses on TMC 1608. Um, you know, it, the goal and the objective of that analysis was to look at the existing regulations, look at um, look at this at the city's process for um, also internal process for um, for permitting and and actually you know administering the code um, and you know, and it explores specific issues related to the urban forestry management plan and what the city's goals are. And so what it does not do, it 
does not cover specifically the um, street tree ordinance or the landscaping ordinance, which will be co covered separately, um, though it does reference them and how they intersect. Um, and it doesn't provide specific amendments. It provides um, some suggestions and presents um, items for general discussion, um, but doesn't specifically provide amendments. And so the gap analysis, which was included in your agenda packet, um, is it organized into three main sections, and that includes an introduction to the project components and the methods that we used, an analysis of the existing regulations, um, and a section devoted to additional recommendations and considerations, which outlines important topics that may not be present in the existing code. And this last section also includes an overview of coordination with um, other city plans and guidelines. So based on the stakeholder engagement process, the internal staff input that we received, as well as work sessions with the tree board and the planning commission, the following topics emerged as priority as priorities for consideration for the code update and the amendments. And the first um, of these was tree retention and replacement requirements. The second was tree protection designations for large diameter trees. So that would be protections that would go above and beyond the, the baseline protections that would be present um, in the code. Um, third was updating methodology for quantifying tree retention. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Permit types and requirements. Incentives for development projects and existing property owners. And then lastly, um, maintenance requirements for tree tracks with within HOAs and commercial industrial sites. So to address these priority topics that emerge, the project team will be exploring a suite of potential amendments to the tree code and permitting process, um, focusing on reorganization of the code sections one of the things that we were really hearing from the community as well as staff is that they really wanted something that was very user friendly, very clear to implement. And so um, one of the things that that we'll be doing is looking at how to make this um, how to make this really clear and well organized topically. We'll also be um, considering early pre-submittal urban forestry review and that is more of a recommendation that um, that would be written that could be written into the code and then um, of course would be a programmatic um, change from what currently happens so this would be having urban forestry and tree retention be part of the very first uh, one of the very first touches that um, that a project goes through when they're doing that that early consult with the city on a project Third would be tree retention and replacement standards. And that gets to the issue of how we quantify um, trees on a, on a parcel and what the requirements are for replacing anything that is removed. Um, we also are making some suggestions for how to um, kind of just improve the process of data collection and the information that um, applicants need to provide to the city so that it's very clear and consistent um, and uh, for the permitting process. And lastly, um, the suggestion of developing a major and minor permit type. So I'd like to take- Actually, Kim, very quickly, yes. could you explain a little bit more what the major and minor permit would look like? Yes, actually, that is my one of my next slides. So I will definitely do that. Um, so let's go ahead, I can go ahead and jump to that. Actually, my, so yeah. Um, so a discussion of the permit types and requirements is found in section 2.7 of the gap analysis. Um, I believe it starts on page 13. Um, so first, you know, I just want to mention that for the permit types and requirements, you know, we were recommending developing um, a user guide within the code. And basically that's just a very simple section of code. It sometimes is often just called applicability, um, but just that just gives a, a snapshot of and outlines 
you know, the types of permits and the process for applicants, um, you know, as they begin to work their way through the through the tree code. So for major and minor permits, essentially, um, you know, we'd be looking at two different criteria. You know, tree removal on private property that's not associated with development would be considered a minor permit. And tree removal that is associated with large scale land clearing in preparation for a development project would be, would be considered a major permit. And there, and the idea behind that is that there would be slightly different um, requirements that an applicant would go through. You know, the minor, clearly the major um, permits would require additional information um, and go through um, a different review process. But the idea is to break them out, um, make the minor, you know, tree removals on, you know, on properties that don't have a big development project be um, simpler and easier to implement administratively, as well as make that process more clear um, and more streamlined for, um, for those applicants. I have a question. Okay. So what is considered uh, minor in terms of someone clear cutting their property and building something. So that would that would fall under a major development project. So if someone were clear cutting and and doing a and building a home, that would fall under a major permit. And and so you know one thing within one of the um, topics that came up during our work was well, what about those? Um, those landowners that actually want to manage their their forest, um, you know, for timber, or they want to to utilize the forest resources on their property, um, and so we would so we actually would recommend having, um, you know, a third designation or a, you know, or a different process for those folks that want to remove, um, utilize the forest products on their property. Um, and uh, and so that would uh, and that would actually be a not a third permit type, but it would I guess fall within um, an exceptions, you know, and have different um, expectations and and would require a forest management plan that they would provide to the city. Um, so minor so a minor permit might be something like someone wants to take out one tree, one or two trees on their property um, because they. Um, are having some work done to, you know, some small scale work done, uh, you know, on their property, but they're not building a new home or doing large scale development. So the minor um, permits for people to cut down trees on their own property I know because it's private property was somewhat limited, but um, is do we still, I've forgotten, do we still have the number in there? So you're allowed to take down so many trees without a permit and- Yes, yeah. um, yeah, so that is actually something that we are considering as well. So there would still be a certain number of allowances. Um, and this is something that we will um, be presenting as part of the amendments. Um, but the idea is that we would, and this is actually something that I have, I actually have another slide to explain a little bit about this too, that what the, um, because what we're also looking at is, um, is shifting um, away from what we currently have, which is, um, you know, which is allowing, you know, a certain number and a certain time frame, and, and requiring that, that each parcel be required to retain um, a certain number of tree credits on their property, and so and if the if that landowner you know has a certain number of tree credits on their property, um, they can they can remove up up till they meet that standard. So it, it's a very similar process, but it's just a different way of doing the accounting. Um, and I can go ahead and go over that if you want. 
I just happen to be a person coming from we're way too generous with that and people take advantage of it and some people don't even get permits and they just go cut down the trees. Someone has done yeah. it several times in the last couple of years, too many times, just in my own neighbor. Mm -hmm. and some of them were large, larger trees. They're not just, you know, small trees that, and, and so I, I think that we have to, we have to consider, you know, what's what's going on in this minor permit area as, in terms of retaining, um, you know, our quote canopy and and yeah and all of that kind of thing. I think we've we've been too lax and generous in that area. Yeah, of course of I'm from we're too generous in every area, but but I mean I just noticed this around the neighborhood, so i that's why I wanted to clarify. What, mm -hmm. have more information about what minor is yeah and and i would just say that you know the you know one of the challenges is that the new programming system will not necessarily make those challenges disappear you know where you have folks that are going to remove trees on their property you know without seeking a permit first um i you know one of the themes that emerged throughout all of the community conversations discussions um, was the was the need for um, really robust um, urban forestry education and outreach to the community, you know, around the importance of tree canopy and large diameter trees, and also the importance of of good enforcement of the regulations that we have in place, and that was something that was of a big concern to the community and and also from the staff. I mean, I think that um, in in talking with the staff, that's also a priority for them as well. Um, and so I I wish I could say that that challenge would go away, you know, with this. But the hope is that. Um, you know, for those instances where people are doing their due diligence, they are seeking a permit, you know. To help manage their trees on their property. Um, that, you know, some of these, uh, that this improvement or shift might um, just help to streamline that process for people and also make it a little bit easier on the staff and, and implementing the code. You know, so that's, um, but I think that, um, but I think outreach and education and, you um, yeah, and good follow through will be will be critical to the success of protecting trees and discouraging illegal tree removal. Council Member Dillard, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, Brad. I just want to add to that. You know, we've been talking about this for a while, and Brad's been tracking all of our comments and questions and the feedback right on this list, right, to get to this point to have the discussion. I I like the report and I like the ideas that we've been talking about for a long time in council and commissions um, regarding how you bring in the companies that are doing this work and incentivizing and like maybe it's a program where the city plants it right and helps you maintain it and then the owner takes over that maintenance right. Um, so I like the thoroughness of your presentation because it's in our packet, but also the report and the ideas um, and so I look forward to discussing that more and taking into account the examples that Joan has. And I think we all have examples personally or that we've seen, right? Like I have three neighbors that remove trees and then I had to do some tree trimming for solar panels, which is one of my comments for um, an example of a permit or a minor permit is trimming and removal for solar. Um, but I asked the companies, cause in the paperwork it says it's the onus is on the homeowner to get the their permit or the waiver, right? And then I asked all the companies and Right, so I think there's opportunities there where we bring in those businesses where they take the ownership as well and not put it on the homeowner because none of them did it, right? So. Yeah, and one of the other things that we talked about, which is really maybe considered a minor administrative step, but uh, we've seen other jurisdiction, jurisdictions, um, you know, require companies as part of getting their business license, you know, with the city that they actually have to you know, um, review and sign a form that says that they understand the city's um, tree regulations and 
and will adhere to that in their work. And, you know, so it's, that is something that we have seen done in other cities um, and that could be integrated into this. Um, so, and I just wanted to mention, you know, that some other jurisdictions, if you were interested, um, that utilize this minor major tree permit um, process um, are Kirkland and Burien and Mercer Island. Um, they have provisions for tree retention, removal and replacement that's based on um, the type of land clearing or tree removal. Some people do their own. So catching this kind of thing with just companies is, is one thing. I think we have two levels of this because some people just clear their own or get their family and friends to come help them cut down trees. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with people that I've stopped to ask them, wow, I love those trees. What's happening here? And uh, they, they didn't get permits. They didn't go through a company. They didn't do anything. So um, I think you're right about, you know, we, we have to have some way to communicate this, but also um, our, our enforcement has been very lax over the years. So it'll be uh, a shock in a way to the community. Um, hopefully not so much so if we do good, you know, outreach and communication, but this is a, this is a, a new, a new step. And especially if we do, um, you know, the enforcement of these new things. So it's just something for us to pay attention to. Yeah. And to speak to your, um, your comment, um, council member Dahlhoff, am I pronouncing that correctly? <laughs> um, that we are actually considering solar panels um, as an exemption, you know, and so, and having some specific criteria around that. So that has been, that is on the list, just so you know. And the awesome. thank you. In our amendments. Yeah, we have actually provided a first draft of amendments that are currently being, you know, reviewed by the city staff. Um, so we're, we'll be working hard on that over the next month or so. To get that to get those developed, um, so in line with uh, first, before I move on, I would I want to talk a little bit more about the tree retention and replacement standards that I mentioned, and this gets to how we quantify tree retention on site specifically. Uh, that that really has a big impact, especially for development projects. Um, but before I move on to that, are any more questions about or comments about the minor or major permit approach? Okay. All right. So um, the tree retention and replacement standards is you'll find that in section 2.9.3 of the gap analysis. Um, and you know what this uh, what this aims to do is look at revising the methodology for quantifying tree retention and replacement. Um, it looks at criteria such as tree size, species, and location. Um, as important to consider when identifying priorities for tree retention. It proposes additional protections for retention of large diameter trees. Um, those are, you know, those are trees that have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term diameter at rest height, um, also sometimes called diameter at standard height, which uh, is at four and a half feet above, um, you know, the ground. And it's a, and it's, it is a measurement of the diameter of the tree. Um, many jurisdictions um, will have a classification um, that they sometimes call a, you know, so, there's different names. Sometimes they call it a landmark tree. Sometimes it's called an exceptional tree. Um, this is not handled um, similar, similarly across all jurisdictions. It's really up to the choice of, of the Tumwater, you know, city council and community. Um, whether you would like to instigate this, but these this could there could be additional protections for those trees that have a DBH of 24 inches or greater. Um, and then, you know, another topic was decreasing the removal allowances on developed properties. So that would be um, something for consideration. So, 
diving into this idea of how do we quantify tree retention on a site on a so as online in the gap analysis you know commonly used strategies for assessing tree retention requirements in tree codes include um, a tree credit approach which is also sometimes referred to as um, tree density or point system um, and then some cities may use a canopy cover approach where they where they look strictly at the percent canopy cover um, on a parcel basis and that's not to be confused with canopy cover measurements that are made citywide you know at a landscape scale it's a it would be it's a different um data point um, so both of those measure methods require a measurement of existing on-site trees and have specific size thresholds for which trees are regulated. Uh, typically, retention credits or points are only given to what we refer to as regulated trees um, of a specific size, and that is very typically um, set at six to eight inches in diameter um, or greater, and which actually excludes invasive trees or noxious weeds, you know, trees that are considered noxious weeds, um, or those trees that have been specifically deemed as um, incompatible with infrastructure. So species like cottonwood and alder, which have really aggressive root systems and often wreak havoc in our, uh, on our sewer um, systems and, um, and on foundations. Um, so the approach that we will be focusing on for the amendment development is this idea of the tree credit approach. Um, and basically, the tree credit approach accounts for the density of existing trees on a parcel, as I mentioned, based on their the trunk's diameter. Um, trees are assigned credits or points based on this on this diameter or size. and Knowing the diameter, the species, and the condition of the trees provides um, also provides insight into the habitat value and the ecosystem services that these trees are providing. And so the larger diameter trees that are correlated with, um, with greater habitat and ecosystem um, health values. So the tree code would, speci would specify a minimum number of credits that would be required to remain on the parcel after development and with the number of credits varying by the size of the parcel. So if the minimum credits are not met, replacement planting would be required. Um, tree credit methods are commonly used um, due to the ease of data collection and does not require access to aerial imagery or online data sources. Um, trunk size is easily measured and verified in the field. Um, other Puget Sound jurisdictions that are using variations of this tree credit approach include Olympia, Burien, Kirkland, Woodenville, and many others. Um, the example referenced in this slide actually comes from the city of Burien. Um, and in this example, one tree credit is required per 1,000 square feet of developable area. And for so for a 5,400 foot square foot lot, 5.4 credits would be required. Um, and based on the size of these 16 trees, um, this particular parcel has 13 tree credits on the site. Um, I will say that there are a number of other variables that go into um, you know tree retention and and how this is evaluated, but this is kind of a simple high level snapshot of, of how the tree retention credits would be calculated for a site. You know, um, items that, or trees that would not be included would be hazard trees. You know, part of that more rigorous, uh, you know, arborist assessment would, that would be required as part of a, an application for the permit would be that there would be a really clear um, assessment of the health and condition of all of the regulated trees on the site, or what we also sometimes call significant trees. Um, so any so for, so for all those trees that are six inches and greater, we would need to have a complete inventory and assessment of the condition um, and status of those trees and anything that was considered, um, you know, inviable or unhealthy would not count towards the tree credits. Any 
any questions or thoughts or ideas on this topic? Uh, I have, I have a question. So like a thousand square feet means that the, the house or whatever the project is, is a thousand square feet. And that's what triggers what number of credits have to remain on the site in total, right? The so, thousand square feet. The thousand square feet actually pertains to the parcel size and the buildable area on the parcel. So okay. it could. So it could. So it's not just the size. So it wouldn't be the size of the homes necessarily. It okay. would be the entire buildable area on the site. Okay. So fifty-four hundred square feet means there's. This is you know like point one point two acres or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, something rather small where a house would take up a pretty good chunk of the lot if you wanted yeah. to build. Mm -hmm. So to so you divide that by a thousand and get the minimum number of credits needed to preserve. So 5.4 minimum credits needs you means you need six credits of trees left on the site, which this image sort of as a hypothetical would demonstrate one way to achieve that but they could also keep the 20 inch tree and the the 15 inch tree and then yeah. still meet that okay exactly. i just want to make sure i was yes, understanding exactly. where the, what the floor means okay. yeah yeah and and that's it and you and that's exactly right is that they would you but one of the other things that the that we would propose in the amendments is that there be is that there be a um you know, as feasible, you know, with the development. Again, we also want to make sure that we're not inhibiting private property owners from reasonable use of their property, you know, um, but we would be encouraging the protection of those larger diameter trees. So uh, our hope would be that in the design process and through early urban forestry consultation with the city, that there could be some discussion of protecting the larger diameter trees. So um, I'm realizing we don't actually have a necessarily a landmark tree in this example of 24 inches or greater, but we would there would be some encouragement to protect the larger diameter trees um, on the site, knowing that, you know, as long as they're they're healthy and viable, um, that they do provide greater canopy cover benefit and and therefore, you know, and the associated, you know, ecosystem services that come with that. And so um, but yes, there would be some flexibility about you know which trees were retained were retained and removed um, but there would be an expectation that they would have to meet the certain threshold of the tree credits on that parcel okay thank you yeah any, any other questions or brad do you want to add anything here uh, no, I, I think you've covered it fairly well. One of the things that you know the staff will be really looking at is, is how the tree credits and things will work, not only, say, at year one with some of these projects, but also year 20. Uh, our concern is we want to make sure that the trees that are planted now will be healthy trees in, in 20 years' time, and that accounts for the fact that uh, they're going to be growing over time and, and taking more area for roots and, and branches and so forth. So especially since we're dealing with our new developments and residential that have very small lots, it's 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 a challenge. So we'll be doing some uh, internal work on just seeing how that will actually look and, and work from there. Hey, Brad, can I add to that really quick? It would be interesting <clears throat> for our areas in Tumwater that are still on septic, like mm -hmm. Southwest area, right? And the limitations of the trees. And so if, you know, Dan has that map of the, maybe neighborhoods or areas of converting to water, right? When the access to water and sewer comes of that timing of then, of, if that's gone, then that tree, right? To mm -hmm. infill those areas that have been limited because of septic, if then, then there's the availability to increase the diversity of these areas with trees. I don't know, so that, that timing piece, I think there's some opportunity there. Yeah, I, I think that's a good thing. And also uh, for this, uh, we were looking primarily at you know redevelopment of properties for the application of this kind of thing, so that would be a good thing to build in. But I'll reach out to Dan and, and get an idea of, of of that map. So I I think that'd be an interesting thing to 
building. I mean, interesting that it looked like because I know for development, but we still have older areas of town water mm-hmm. that I think there's a lot of opportunity to increase that canopy. Yeah, I agree. Okay, great. Well, so that is all that I have for this morning. Um, you know, next steps, as Brad and I have mentioned, you know, we're in the process of actually drafting the amendments right now based on the gaps analysis and the feedback that we received from the Planning Commission and Tree Board and stakeholders. Um, and so, you know, and so we will continue that work over the next several weeks. And Brad, did you want me to go over kind of the specific calendar um, of, of dates of next steps, um, or would you like to? No, I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. So okay. um, your next GGC meeting in March will be covering uh, introduction to both the street tree plan update and the landscaping update. So similar to what we've done Today, we'll take you through the process we've, we've gone through for those projects. Also, our intent is to, uh, ultimately our schedule is to bring this back to you in ordinance form in July. However, I what I'd like to do is probably in April or May, uh, I'll come back and we'll have a further discussion of where we are uh, in terms of the staff's direction, uh, in terms of some of these code changes. And I think it would be useful just to walk you through so you have a better understanding of how the, the mechanics of these things might work. Um, and if you would like a copy of a recent example, um, I can certainly send you one that uh, the city of Burien completed their update in October of last year. Uh, it, I think it's a, it's a good one. It doesn't necessarily match us exactly, but I think has a lot of the concepts we talked about. So if you'd like me to provide that to you, I can do that. Um, I, I'd certainly be interested in looking at that, Brad, if, if you wouldn't mind sending it. Um, can I ask one more? I hate to dial us back a teeny bit, but I do have a, a question about, like, I I'm obviously do not have a, a science background. Well, I, I don't know if social science counts as a science background, but um, what are all trees under, like, what you, what the the considerations are being made, are all trees kind of created equal based on on canopy like my understanding is there's some kinds of trees that canopy is and width of the the trunk is is not the only kind of thing that could be a benefit I'm thinking for instance of like hawthorn trees where a lot of native birds eat the fruit that is from those things Um, and some other trees are like you said, sort of hazardous or messy where the roots get into sewer systems, but are there like bonus points in the calculation for if you have a native tree that serves dual ecological purposes in addition to just canopy? That is certainly something that could be considered um, in this amendment process. Um, There are some cities which give additional points for conifers because they provide year round stormwater management benefits um, because they are leaf on during our rainy season, you know? Um, And so there are there, you know, we have seen examples where conifers have been prioritized. There have, um, there's also been, um, you know, I would argue, of course, as a, 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 as a, in my forest ecology background that all trees provide habitat benefit, you know, for a, for a diversity of different, um, you know, species, but mm-hmm. yes, there, there are certainly certain trees that, especially in urbanized areas, you know, um, provide um, provide good forage and nesting opportunities for, for birds. Um, we are not, you know, we have been working from, um, there are a lot of different um, variables that we could be considering in terms of prioritizing habitat value which has been raised as part of the, this, this discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and where we have landed in our discussions for the for the regulation process is to is to use you know tree diameter um, you know as a as a surrogate for for habitat value, you know. Um, 
and like, or I guess habitat benefits. Mm -hmm. But we could certainly um, consider adding incentives and you know prioritizing native native trees and conifers as they're appropriate. I think one of the most um, important things, as Brad started to mention, in terms of looking ahead to twenty years, is that we really want you know there there will really be different types of development projects and in highly urbanized environments you know, some of our larger native trees may not be appropriate for those sites and they wouldn't grow um, to their healthy, mature size um, in, a, in a constrained urban environment with a lot of infrastructure. And so we really also want to encourage the use of that concept that's throughout the urban forestry management plan of right tree in the right place. Um, we also will be thinking about, and this is a slightly different topic, but we also want to be thinking about um, climate change adaptation and, um, and the fact that there are some species and cultivars of trees that perform better um, under you know, extended periods of drought and high heat um, and may respond better in, in an area where we have an urban heat island you know, and increased temperatures. And so those are also considerations that really get into the nitty gritty and forgive me for the pun, but getting into the weeds of you know, the, the application process and the review process. Um, but those are also, I think, considerations when we're thinking about, you know, how we're prioritizing trees for retention and what we're prioritizing for replacement. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I, th I think it'd be an interesting thing to look at, but I, I appreciate the other points that you sort of make about that as well. Yeah. Thank you. I I'd like to say, uh, Brad, I'd like a copy of the Burian thing. And also, Michael, social sciences do count because trees are social. Uh, <laughs> trees, True. and it amazingly so. Uh, trees, yeah. trees take care of each other. They, they communicate. They do all kinds of things. And yeah. uh, it makes me a little um, nervous, Kim, that the main thing we're going to use is just the size of the trunk. I think what Michael just brought up in the discussion we had and your experience as a forestry person, I think we're, I think we're that that's, I, I think we need to be looking at this from an environmental climate change lens more so than we are. I, I, if we do not balance environment and development, we are, we, we are not going by what we say we believe and the things we signed on to that we're going to do for climate change. And so this tree business for me is, is um, bigger than just, you know, saying, well, we can, well, instead of looking at what Michael um, brought up in more depth and as part of our ordinances, just say, well, it has to do with the size of the tree um, is uh, myopic in terms of, uh, of the overall thing. But that's, that's, uh, my opinion, and I'm, you know, way over to one side when it comes to to all of this. But I do think balance here is an important thing, and I don't want to get, you know, narrow about about looking at when we have this opportunity to do this, which we haven't looked at this tree ordinance in years. That this is this is our time, and now we're in the midst of, uh, you know, trees are key to to us you know, doing our, doing our, make, keeping our promises about climate change. So anyway. Yeah, and I greatly appreciate that feedback and those comments. And I know that it seems like using um, the diameter is, a, is an oversimplification. Um, I would say that from, from a regulatory and implementation process, it's definitely, and also from, you know, what we know about large diameter trees is that they do provide greater stormwater um, benefit. They, they do create broader habitat value, you know, in, in terms of um, carbon sequestration, uh, you know, mitigating the impacts of, um, you know, of, of higher temperatures, provide greater shade, you know, like there is a, and I think that that's something that um, is not to be discounted, you know, and, 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 and using that as a measure. I will say that, you know, it is, but it is one measure, and I agree. And I, I don't want the 
tree regulation process to seem like we're oversimplifying. We definitely have been okay. discussing and considering all of those very important topics that you raised. Um, and when we provide the, the amendments, we can continue to have this conversation and see, you know, how can we how can we shape this and um, and and work this so that we are um, addressing these issues in the way that um, that both um, provides for reasonable use of the property and development while also protecting Tumwater's environmental health and you know addressing issues like climate change. So anyway, yeah, uh, no, I agree. Thank you, thank you for allowing me to talk about that too, because yeah. you know the the ordinance that we are are updating here um, was written before some of this climate crisis situation that we're in. So I'm, I think that I'm glad that Michael brought up, you know, the birds and the bees and the, uh, you know, all the different species and things and what they do and, um, and just wanted him to know that social science counts because yeah. trees are social. Yeah. Well, and I would and, and I would also add that, you know, the social science around trees is very rigorous. Um, that there has been a lot of looking at the the social and emotional health um, that trees provide to the community, traffic calming, crime re reduction. There's a large body of social science research that links um, trees to community health and individual health, both human health and ecological health. That's why people say I feel better after I go out and sit under a tree. Yeah, I can, I can be remember as a child being sent out to sit under the tree for a while and calm myself down. My grandpa used to say, you go talk to that tree out there. She's your friend. <laughs> Thanks for all that, Kim, appreciate it. Yeah, did you, do you have any uh, final thoughts or questions before we move on to our, our final agenda item here? Um, as a chemist, Michael, I'll talk to you later about social science. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you for, for this uh, treason pre presentation. Um, I did it like that. That was fun. I thought of that yesterday and I was trying to work it in for the past half hour. Um, but it, so this is more to come. Um, this sounds great, but I, I don't think any action is needed today, correct? We're just uh, receiving this update and then future updates to come. Correct. Great, um, thank you. And I suppose now we will move on to our next docket item, the preliminary uh, docket for the 2023 comp plan amendments. All right, a uh, couple things before we move on. Um, my father's a chemist, so I'll, we can have a further offline discussion about <clears throat> those of us who graduated in the humanities and those kinds of things. Anyway, uh, I also want to very quickly uh, share some news. If I haven't shared this already, uh, we have a planner who is going to be joining our department next Thursday on the 16th that I'm really happy to introduce you to at our next meeting. Um, her name is Erica Smith Jones, Erica, <laughs> Erica Smith Erickson. Uh, she will be joining us and she'll be doing everything. Um, so I think you'll like her. Um, <laughs> and Mike called her earlier this week and confirmed she is coming. So that's the other thing. Where is she, where is she coming from? Uh, currently she is working with uh, Thurston County and she's been with them for about five years now. Uh, her background, she has a pretty good background in current planning, uh, but she will be exposed to everything that we do on the long range side. And so uh, she impressed us through the interview process. Uh, so we're looking to good, looking for good opportunities to help her grow with the city. Could you say her name one more time? I try to say her name. Eric, Erica Smith Erickson. Okay. Uh, all right, last item that I have for you today is the uh, preliminary docket for 2023 comprehensive plan amendments. Um, as you remember, the council last fall uh, put on hold all private applications for comp plan amendments. So we do have some public amendments as in city sponsored things that, that need to be uh, approved and completed before we get through the comprehensive plan update process. 
And there are two things that are on the preliminary docket that the uh, Planning Commission has reviewed and recommended go forward to review uh, under the final docket. And that first is the uh, capital facilities plan, which is updated every two years, uh, alternate years from your city budget, uh, and also adoption of the Highway 99 transportation plan. Uh, that will be part of uh, the comp plan uh, as a plan. So those are the two items uh, that we would like to go forward as part of the final docket. Uh, if you have any questions about those items, I can try to answer them now. Uh, again, this process is really just sort of setting the things that staff reviews and brings back to planning commission at the end of July uh, for approval as part of the amendment process. But so, so we would essentially approve those two pieces for the docket, which then goes on our consent calendar. And what happens in July is when we actually review the, the substantive work product for that. So right now, essentially our action would just direct staff to begin the process of working on that work product. Exactly, right? exactly. That's our code process is set up. Essentially the council has the ability to, to set the agenda uh, the docket for what items are reviewed and not reviewed. And this is part of, this is that part of the process. Okay. Does anyone have questions about adding those two public items to the docket? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is uh, there a motion for us to add those two items to the docket and to schedule this for city council meeting for the consent calendar on February 21st. So moved. Motion by council member Dahlhoff and I'll second it. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I believe that is the last item on our agenda unless uh, there's any Good to the order. It doesn't look like Brad has any additional items for the agenda. Uh, no, Brad's so, done with us. So yeah. <laughs> so with that, I, I think we are adjourned. Thanks everyone for a quick meeting. All right. See you all next month.